UC Davis is taking a six-game win streak up to Cheney to face Eastern Washington. It's homecoming for the Eagles. Will they pull off their second top 25 upset in a row? Welcome to This Week in Big Sky Football. Three, two, one, go! Hello and welcome to This Week in Big Sky Football. I'm your host, Megan Robinson. UC Davis quarterback Miles Hastings is coming off a career performance against Cal Poly. He and the Aggies head up to Eastern Washington this weekend for our game of the week. That Aggie defense has forced a turnover in seven straight games, but will they be able to do enough to slow down the leading receiver in the Big Sky in Efton Chisholm III? Joining me now to discuss this matchup is head coach of the Eagles, Aaron Best. Coach, thanks so much for joining me. Last week, you called the game against Sacramento State bizarre. However, you walked away with a conference win over a ranked opponent. What does a victory like that do for team morale? Well, I think any win obviously puts you in a different frame of mind. Um, you know, results drive believability um, in sport in life. And uh, we've been close many times this, this year. Going on the road, chase our first big sky victory this year. Certainly boost morale. Going to do uh, you know, our third game. Now bringing it back home against UC Davis, who again is littered with a great team. High offensive firepower. So we got our work cut out for us. So uh, we can't uh, rest our laurels too long. We'll get into that matchup with the UC Davis in just a minute. You mentioned they have a lot of great players. You yourself also have a handful of great players. One of those being Efton Chisholm III, the leading receiver in the Big Sky Conference. He's in his final year in Cheney. He wants to be remembered as an Eagle legend, so he said himself. What has he meant to your program over his tenure there? When he came uh, in my office after last year, uh, knowing he had other opportunities um, for a for a senior year somewhere else, uh, he said that exact thing. I want to I want to end where I started. Uh, gave me an opportunity. I'm trying to make the most of it, and I want to live uh, in the same halls as, as Cooper Cup at uh, at an institution that's known for wide receiver play. Uh, so that spoke volumes, and that's who he is uh, as a person, and he carries that onto the field. And uh, I'm just trying to take in every every day, honestly, with him the next couple months. Uh, to truly appreciate what he stood for, what he will stand for, and what he's meant to this program and this football football team for the last four years. Of course, the guy throwing Efton Chisholm the ball is quarterback Kakoa Vesperis. He ranks in the top five in the conference in passing yards, zero interceptions this season. How would you assess his decision-making under center? I think the first thing that comes to mind is efficiency. At the end of the day, um, his decision-making up to this point this season has been tremendous. Another year under Coach Chapin's tutelage has allowed him to grow in uh, more areas than just yards. Looking ahead to your matchup with UC Davis, your offense is about to face their defense, who has had a turnover in seven straight games. They have three defensive touchdowns this season. What is the best way for your guys to practice ball security and prepare for this matchup? First off, UC Davis's defense a lot of times keeps everything in front of uh, themselves. So they're seeing all the action. They don't get uh, let things go behind them. It's hard to create and force turnovers when people are behind you. Everybody's got to be at least in front or if not on the side. They get to the quarterback when they need to. Uh, they're a slow you down, you know, run outfit, uh, run defense outfit, but they're keeping in front of you pass outfit. They're not going to get beat uh, by beating themselves. They do a good job taking it away. Uh, we've done a good job possessing. Something's got to give on Saturday. You can't talk about UC Davis without mentioning the reigning offensive player of the year in Lan Laris, and he has accounted for over a thousand yards of the Aggies offense this season. How do you game plan for a guy who can get it down on the ground or through the air? He's a difficult player to scheme against because they put him in so many different positions and he's one of the best players uh, that I've witnessed uh, in person on film this league has ever had. He just gets it football IQ out of this world. You can just tell from a distance uh, that he's not not only uh, able to do what they ask him to do, but then go above and beyond with his intangibles. Um, he's a tough tackle, got great speed. Uh, and again, the hardest thing to scheme is is where he's going to be. He's located in different, different spots. He just wills his team to victory um, by what he does uh, on the field uh, from, from my perspective, but I'm sure off the field and in uh, his teammates' perspective. Got to meet him last summer. Uh, incredible human being, not a loud talker. Uh, but I'll tell you what, his, his, his ball is, uh, is loud enough for us. 
Up next, hear from head coach of the UC Davis Aggies, Tim Plow. Yeah, definitely. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Thanks. See you next okay. week. Bye. All right. Thanks. All right. Take care. Bye, everyone. Welcome back to This Week in Big Sky Football. I'm your host, Megan Robinson, joined now by the head coach of the UC Davis Aggies, Tim Plow. Coach, last time we spoke, you said you didn't think your team was playing their best football yet. How close do you think they are now, a few weeks later, they are reaching their full potential? Yeah, I thought this was the first week um, where we played consistently at the level I think we can play at. And um, it was it was a great moment for them. They've been pushing forward. Can they be consistent enough to put a bunch of drives together and play for a complete game? So um, I know we were really happy with the outcome on Saturday. Um, not so much with winning the game as much as just us playing well for the entirety of a football game. And hopefully with that builds some momentum, which we're going to need uh, as we go to the end of the conference here. Quarterback Miles Hastings went 27 for 30 for 458 yards, four touchdowns, and only played in three quarters. What word would you use to describe his performance? When I think of Miles, I just think of resiliency. I mean, he's a very resilient player. Uh, he's been through a lot in his career, ups and downs. I'm just so proud of him and happy that he's having these moments and people can see how talented and special he really is. He really makes this thing go, his accuracy, his uh, ability to read the defense, get the ball out on time. Hopefully, again, he's built some confidence, get some momentum going, because um, if he's playing like that, I think we're a tough tough team to stop. Lan Larison seems to have a highlight reel worthy play every single game. This week, of course, it was that hurdle for the touchdown. How would you rate his overall athleticism and his ability to pull these rabbits out of his hat, so to speak? <laughs> I think every week, you know, we get to the end of the game and every week there's something we're watching on film. We're like, gosh, how in the world did he did he do that? It's something I think as the NFL scouts come by every week, they're, they talk about that a lot, that you're, you're so impressed with his balance, um, his athleticism. And I think what he's proven is, you know, he's got over a thousand yards total. So he's he's our leading receiver right now in receptions. He's obviously having a great year running the football. When you can have that type of skill set at that position, it, it just creates a lot of problems for defenses. So We've been able to get him the football in different ways, knowing that a lot of teams are trying to take him out of the run game. And uh, for him to be able to show that athleticism and his route running and get him out in space and then to make people miss, that's what makes him, in my opinion, uh, you know, the best player in the country. On the defensive side of the ball, Rex Connors' pick six marks your third defensive touchdown of the season. You've had a turnover in every game so far, seven straight games with a turnover. Why is your defense so successful at forcing fumbles or interceptions? The first thing I would say is it's something we practice, you know, every week we, we practice the fundamentals and techniques that it takes to create turnovers. Coach Coombs and the defensive staff do a great job schematically at creating confusion for the quarterbacks on the back end and also creating situations where we can get multiple tacklers at the ball. And those are normally the things that are going to lead to turnovers in a game. So I think that we're doing a good job of mixing those two things. And then as for the scoring, you know, we've made an emphasis from the start from when I got here, like if you want to win a conference championship, if you want to compete in the playoffs, your defense needs to turn those turnovers into, into points. And so they take a lot of pride in trying to get the football and get in the end zone with it. You will be facing the best receiver in the big sky this week when you head to Cheney to take on Eastern Washington and Efton Chisholm the third. What is the key to trying to limit their big plays? He is special. He's a great route runner. I think they do a great job of moving him into different spots within the formation. So he can line up in the slot. He can line up outside. He can line up in the backfield. And uh, that just tells me he's a smart football player. We're going to have to find some ways, hopefully, to, to limit him, knowing that we probably won't take a guy like that out of the game completely. They just do a great job offensively of, of getting their playmakers the ball, and he's a tremendous player. Dante Sashray played his way into the record books with his sixth touchdown performance in the Vikings win over Idaho State. The Big Sky Offensive Player of the Week joins me after the break. We never set out to be the largest casino resort in the Pacific Northwest. We just wanted to be the best. But we forgot that being the best means more guests wanting more action, more jackpots, more big name entertainment, more pedicures. Well, more everything. Until one day you look up and realize, 
We need a new hotel tower. The new River Tower, to be exact. Northern Quest in Spokane, Washington. Now the largest, and yes, still the best. Now Sasha Ray wants to run. He's doing some damage. He's got the first down, and now he's gone down the far sideline. One man to beat. They will get him, and Dante Sasha Ray will take it 62 yards. Dante Sachere threw for 216 yards and ran for another 202 yards to become the first Portland State quarterback and third Big Sky quarterback to record a 200-200 game. Dante, how does it feel to make history? Uh, it was it was kind of surreal. You know, I didn't know until after the game, you know, our guy, Mike Lund, had came up to me and he was like, uh, first ever to do 200 and 200. And like when he said it, I didn't really register yet. And I was like, because, you know, big win, first win of the season. So I was so hyped about that. And then when I thought about it, I'm like, oh, wow, that's – I don't, I haven't heard too many people getting that. So that was pretty cool. Coach Barnum said, you were fantastic. They sent six players at you, and you run for a 62-yard touchdown. That stuff doesn't happen on EA Sports. What's your reaction to your coach's comments? Uh, it's kind of funny, you know, but at the same time, he he expects me to do stuff like that. So, like, when I do it, it's regular to him. So that's – Yeah. <laughs> Nearly three quarters of your rushing yards came on three explosive runs. What was their defense giving you that allowed you to be so dominant on the ground? Uh, yeah, like you said earlier, they were sending six guys at me pressure-wise and then playing man behind it so everyone is locked on the man. And then in those situations, they usually forget about the quarterback. So when they blitz and I was able to find a crease and sneak out of there, there was no one there for me. How much credit do you have to give your O-line for creating those creases that allowed you to run for over 200 yards? Yeah, you know, they they get all the praise in the world for I, I look good on paper, but they're the ones doing all the the real work that no one really sees down in the trenches. So I couldn't thank them enough, you know, picking up their guys, getting into their gaps, letting me being able to go out there and run. I think it was your first touchdown. I counted you broke at least three tackles on that run. What's going through your mind as you're running downfield trying to elude all the defenders? Yeah. Uh well first it was it was third and long. So I'm like, all right, in my head, I'm like, I gotta get the first down. So when I take off running, make the first guy miss, I'm like, all right, I think I'm at the first down mark. And then when I get spun around and I'm still on my feet, I'm like, uh, all right, I got to keep running. And then I just take it down the sideline, make another guy miss, and then go in for the touchdown. You were responsible for all six of Portland State's touchdowns in that game, three on the ground, three through the air. What challenges does your ability to get it done either way present to defenses? Uh, I feel like, you know, definitely hard. You know, they have to get ready for my legs and my arm. Um, trying to contain me in the pocket, but then at the same time, I can drop back and throw. So that dual threat quarterback is always tough for defenses to try to figure out. The dual threat quarterback has kind of emerged even more so over the years. You see it with Lamar Jackson, Patrick Mahomes, Kyler Murray. You are one yourself. What are the keys to excelling as a dual threat quarterback? Uh, keeping the defense on their toes, not knowing what's going to come next. Like I said, I could throw it. I could run it. I could get out the pocket, make a throw, or keep running. So having those options makes it uh, difficult on the defense to try to hone in on one thing. How do you use this performance to build momentum going into the back half of Big Sky play? Yeah, try to build on it. You know, we try to tell our guys uh, one week at a time, try to be 1-0, carrying over, you know, first win, got a lot of uh, team uh, amped up. So being able to keep that composure and move it on to the next week and then try to do the same thing. Still to come, how NAU alum Khalil Dorsey's perseverance turned into a career in the NFL. Khalil Dorsey didn't choose to play for NAU because it gave him the best shot at the NFL. In fact, he hadn't even thought about playing professionally until his senior year of college. Dorsey is proof that you can go from FCS to having success at the next level. However, his journey from Flagstaff to Detroit was anything but linear. The challenge is always in the back of your mind that you're at the FCS school and it's not like you're always watching the bigger teams like, oh, they're ranked and they're in the FBS, like they get more attention and stuff like that. And you think like just because you're a little guy, it doesn't matter who you go against, um, like you're never going to make it type of thing. So that was always in the back of your mind. 
The doubt might have been in Khalil Dorsey's mind, but it didn't show up in his play. Senior year, it went it went pretty well um, in terms of like PBUs and tackles. I had I think like 60 tackles on the season as a corner. That's like that's unheard of. So I thought, you know, at least I can get a shot, you know, of, of anything. It doesn't even matter. I had to get an agent. I didn't know when you sign for an agent that your your college career is done. So that was a big decision. And then once I did that, it was like all my all my eggs were in that basket. Dorsey's final down of college football came in January 2020 at the Hula Bowl. He began training for his shot in the NFL shortly after. Less than a week before his pro day, COVID would change everything. They had gave me a call and said that they had they had canceled our pro day, and I was just you know. I was just, you know, heartbroken. So what we did is just like record everything. So I did my my bench press with the the place that he had, and then I did uh, my 40 yard um, with like a timer in front of the camera. I did I did a whole bunch of things. So um, yeah, I mean, I would say it was it was difficult, but um, God always had a plan. Dorsey signed with the Ravens as an undrafted free agent. He played in six games before a shoulder injury landed him on injured reserve. I feel like it was difficult because you're in your head, especially coming back towards it. At the beginning, you're not thinking that. They're just like, you know, you're injured, you're worried about that. But then once you start getting the shoulder back, it's like gaining that confidence and tackling, especially because it's your shoulder and tackling, uh, try to get past breakups and stuff and thinking of like, you know, your coaches are thinking, am I an asset or a liability? How did you end up with the Detroit Lions? So we had two years with the Ravens. Um, then I got released. I went to the New York Giants. Then after that, I got released, was sitting on the couch for like, I think it was 13 weeks. And then the, the week I started applying the job, just because I was bored at home, I got a call from the Lions and that's when they put me on uh, their practice squad. Um, finished out that season with them. And then that next year, um, you know, after everything was said and done, after three preseason, preseason games, they signed me again. And I was just grateful. On October 14th, 2023, after nearly a year on the practice squad, Dorsey was activated by the Lions. I full-heartedly believe that it doesn't, it doesn't matter where you go. There's a lot of people in the league that come from different places, uh, FCS, H, HBCUs, uh, Division II. If you can play ball, you don't gotta transfer to somewhere else. It does, like If you can play ball where you're at, ball out, ball out and they will come and find you. When you think about your journey to the NFL and the career that you've had, what part makes you the most proud? I'll say my family is saying like, you know, I know you could do it type of thing. Like instead of them being like, like surprised at it, it was just like, I knew you could do it just because, you know, that, that journey was hard and they, they saw how long it took to, for me to get there. Welcome back to This Week in Big Sky Football. I'm Megan Robinson. This week, the conference gave us come from behind wins, record breaking performances, and a number one team in the country. Here's what you might have missed Idaho defender Alyssa Peter secured her place in the record books when she tallied her 28th career assist. That is the most in Big Sky Conference history. Montana soccer remains unbeaten at home after posting a win and a draw over the weekend. On the court, Idaho State Volleyball remains at the top of the conference after a thrilling five-set victory over defending Big Sky champs and preseason favorites Weber State. UNC enters Week 8 on a three-match win streak. After wins at Portland State and at Sacramento State, the Bears remain a perfect 8-0 on the road. Eastern Washington has also been finding success away from home. They swept the Treasure State with back-to-back -back wins over Montana State and Montana. Plus, NAU Volleyball debuted their alternate identity Astro Jack uniforms Thursday night. It was the second of six appearances across four sports for Bluey the Space Ox. NAU Cross Country continues to reign supreme. A victory at the Notre Dame Invitational moved their women into sole possession of first place in national polls. That's what happened this week around the big sky. Joined now by a familiar face to the Big Sky Conference, Sam Herter of Hero Sports. Sam, appreciate you taking time to chat Big Sky football. The conference play has been unpredictable so far this season, to say the least. What have you learned watching the Big Sky over the last few weeks? Yeah, it's been a very entertaining conference, and I think Montana State has established itself as the top team uh, and I think UC Davis has kind of started living up to its potential. You know, some other teams are kind of hard to figure out. Northern Arizona is hard to figure out and Weber State is hard to figure out. Uh, there's a little more uncertainty in the middle of the conference standings than maybe some years past. Which team do you think is a dark horse to make a late playoff push here? 
Northern Arizona is kind of lingering, uh, you know, right now as, as a potential team that can make the playoffs. Because I think Montana State and UC Davis are both positioned pretty well to make the postseason. I think Montana can get in there as well. Uh, Idaho has had a brutal start to the season uh, just schedule wise and that their schedule now eases up. And so I think the pathway is there for Idaho to also get into the postseason. Montana State on the road to face Portland State. Montana State, of course, coming off that dominant top 10 win against Idaho. And then on the flip side, the Portland State Vikings, they have Dante Sachere, National Player of the Week for his 200 rushing, 200 passing yard performance, six touchdowns. Seems like it could potentially be a trap game in a sense for the Bobcats. Who do you like in this one? Just with how Montana State is is playing right now, um, especially you know their defense will travel well. Um, offensive line being dominant that always travels well. So I think you have to favor the Cats. But you're right in that this could be a trap game. I think Montana State is just going to be too much to to lose this one. And finally, our game of the week: UC Davis going into the Inferno to face Eastern Washington on their homecoming. Who are you taking in this matchup? Yeah, I'll, I'll take UC Davis, uh, but I think it could be a pretty entertaining back and forth game. Uh, two really good quarterbacks as well with this uh, Vesperis going up against Hastings. Um, and Hastings has had a huge role in UC Davis taking that next step as a team. So I think he's elevated his play as well uh, at quarterback. Sam, appreciate you taking the time to chat Big Sky Football. You'll be back with me next week for the midseason FCS All-In Show. All right, thanks. Uh, thank you for having me. It is shaping up to be another good one in the Inferno. Thank you so much for joining me for another episode of This Week in Big Sky Football. I'm your host, Megan Robinson. I will see you all next week. For all the latest Big Sky content, subscribe to our YouTube channel.